They want to teach CRT, not as history, but as narrative, as a story. But every story has what? A protagonist and an antagonist. So who is the bad guy in the slave narrative? Well, that depends on largely who's telling the story and what their agenda is. For instance, it could be the white man, just in, overall in general. Or it could be the South. Listen, it could be Democrats. It could even be Republicans. But it can also be other blacks who don't subscribe to the group think, the rhetoric, nor the victimology. Notice how liberal blacks who are wealthy and privileged, for example, a LeBron James, they will portray themselves as a victim despite their wealth and their privilege. That's intentional. It allows them to be the spokespeople to push the narrative on the masses. Now, think about the term coon. Who says that? It is the liberal blacks. And why do they say it? And to whom? When anyone doesn't go along with the group think, when they don't go along with the narrative, they think for themselves. So then it becomes a control mechanism. When you're told that you ain't black enough, same thing. It's a control mechanism. I want you to notice how none of the liberals have any real solutions. None of them. Notice how the non-liberal blacks portray themselves. They portray themselves as being sympathetic, empathetic, and on our side. That they are an ally. They not only understand our plight, but they're fighting for our plight. Now, think about this. Who actually wants CRT taught? I assure you, it is the white liberal. The black liberals take their cue from their white liberal overlords. You don't have any of those liberal blacks fighting for school vouchers or school choice or better teachers. Behind every black liberal is a white liberal puppet master. I'm trying to recall the name of the woman who uh, wrote the book uh, Super Macho and the Myth of the Black Woman. Uh, I think that's the title. Um, but she's the one who, quote unquote, introduced feminism into black America through that book, which she didn't even write. Behind her was the CIA asset, Gloria Steinem. And of course, everything I'm saying is alleged. White liberals are the ones who shape and control the narrative that's being pushed onto black America. And that narrative is being taught from a Hegelian dialectic dynamic so that everyone, both sides, are being affected by that same story. You cannot have an oppressor without the oppressed. Now, back to the original topic at hand. We are talking about story and the accusation against the scriptures. As we've already said, we share a common ancestry. We go back far enough. At one time, there was a shared dominant culture, belief system, and societal story. And that story was first shared and passed down orally. It then went into written form and was passed down. Now, that's what it was written on the wall of a cave, a, a cuneiform tablet, or papyrus paper, or a scroll. Now, at some point, mankind was dispersed among and throughout the planet. And those common shared stories were still being told and shared. I know that's redundant. But somewhere, somehow, the details got changed. Listen, names were changed not to protect the innocent, but to reflect a different a differing ideology and a variant belief system that began to emerge. Story is about survival. 
people groups, even though they're still sharing the same history and sharing the basic tenets of that story, is going to evolve. Certain point, portions are going to be changed. Why? Because those people groups, they develop different gods. Those different gods that they developed, you'll notice that they all share the same characteristics and attributes from culture to culture. The names may be different, but they share the same characteristics and attributes. For instance, the Canaanite deity known as Baal. To the Greeks, he became the storm god Zeus. Now, as it pertains to the ancient world, there are several dominant historical figures. And they were seen as great teachers of man and as a god. They took on mythical proportions. Some of the ancient deities are patterned after these people. Here's what I mean. The chief individuals who impact history, especially the ancient world, those individuals were Adam, Eve, Noah, Cush, and Nimrod. There are others, but these are the main historical figures. So, as these groups begin to spread out, when you examine the origin story that each ancient culture has, when you look and examine their deities, it is going to be a variation or an amalgamation or some kind of distortion of at least one or more of those individuals that I just named. For example, there's something called Mother Goddess Worship. Now, listen, Samaramis, which is Nimrod's wife, and by the way, she's Isis in Egyptology. Isis, Astarte, Anat, Ketesh, just to name a few, those are ancient comedic goddesses. But they are all the same entity, the same person. Now, with the different names, they are focusing and highlighting a different character trait or attribute, but it's the same person. Now, in European lore, those same comedic goddesses, they became Aphrodite, Minerva, Juno, and Hera. They are all talking about the same individual and the impact that those individuals had on mankind and history. Now, again, remember, all these different cultures came from one shared global culture that dominated the planet. But ultimately, in Mother Goddess worship, they are all a representation of just one person, and that would be Eve. Adam, on the other hand, became known as Ptah, the first great teacher and liberator of man. Those who believe that Adam and the serpent actually set man free from a tyrannical God. And then they will point to the flood, proof of his tyranny. And with the Tower of Babel, I don't know off topic, but so with, with the Tower of Babel, what they were trying to do is to create a culture, a civilization, and a defense mechanism so that the Most High could never destroy them again with the flood. Now, Nimrod became Tammuz which became Horus and Haru. Now, here's what I want you to know about Nimrod. The, Nimrod himself believed that he was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, that he, the mighty hunter, was the great liberator and savior of mankind. Here's the problem. He gets executed. He gets killed. So when he gets killed, how do they keep that lie going? How do they keep the story moving forward?